just so you know, I never really seriously considered myself any royalty having to do with any other country, including one that did not have official national sovereignty recognition by the occupying power or the international community. But I had in my life met people that I admired greatly. And I said to myself, if I was involved in some sort of party or some sort of political effort where I was given a say in what I would consider to be a slate of candidates for political office in that country, then these would be the eight people that I would choose. These would be the eight people I've met in my life that identify themselves as part of that national cause that I think would make a exceptional leadership. And I would actually have at the time that I understood, I would have served them. It was an understanding of what I considered to be a kind of leadership that I believed in and would be willing to stand by. And I stand by that to this day. Now, I understand that when I wrote that list of names, and I was thinking about for myself what I understood would be a kind of leadership paradigm in which I would like to and believe that I personally also was invested um, in my own manner. I put that list with other things that were a part of what my life was at that time and I gave it to somebody. And I gave it to somebody as actually a spiritual test that has its own implications. If you're not going to speak with me in a manner where we first ground and identify ourselves within a holy space to go through this together, then I'm not going to say anything more about it than that. And I don't need to make any excuses and I don't need to answer to anybody. It was a test of faith. And apparently it was a mortal test. And I'm not dead. And to this day, I still stand behind what I did. Because the people I knew at that time, I absolutely believed in enough to stand up for and with, and if necessary, fight for. There were eight people, men and women. Now, at some point, that individual, that list and other things connected to what was put in that bag got into hands I had absolutely no intention of them getting into. And those eight people became eight lines of credit associated with at least how the treaties enforced through the Department of State represented it to be lines of credit under the heading of finance associated with a political party that, to be honest with you, I don't think any of them would have been a member of. I don't think that, at least so far as they told me, None of them identified themselves as the kind of people that would have been a member of the political party that was the majority party that ended up being allowed to be put in political leadership in the occupation government that was formed without their engagement by and large because they were actually too young to even participate in the negotiations at the time that occurred, right? But somehow... That was the manifestation of what I would have considered to be an appropriate political leadership paradigm. Now, almost all of them are citizens of the United States. And if they weren't citizens, then they were at least at some point in time legally in the United States and had a legitimate relationship with the United States that was of such that with, uh, by now they could very well be citizens. And... Unfortunately, because of the deception that was engaged and what ended up happening, that what ended up happening with the, that particular faith or that particular belief in what is appropriate political leadership that was respectful to what they had let me know about their lives and desires, it was not honored or respected. And it didn't also even really have practicable political expediency or legitimacy unless one debases oneself into a kind of prurience that I now understand in a much broader context than I did at the time, i.e. the kidnapping of hostages by those Iranian students is somehow supposed to be symbolic of what could be considered a form of statecraft. I don't agree. I think a much more important and practicable, respectful form of not only domestic uh, policy uh, aims as expressed, but also international solidarity and authenticity in terms of political priorities would have been perhaps to do something representative of the relationships the United States had with who would have been considered to be the negotiating partner for the occupation infrastructure. And then to instead of acknowledge their individual expertise and desires in the form of honoring that treaty on desalination that was 
set up after the first intifada. See, it's hard to find that. I can't find it anywhere online. It's been replaced by other agreements around technology sharing with Israel. As a matter of fact, I think that one of the major free trade area agreements, which was the topic of my first public speaking endeavor ever, uh, might have attempted to either bury that or supplant it. But in the 80s, there was a treaty that was negotiated that involved five countries as direct participants and five other countries as observers and supporters of an effort to assist the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian national cause uh, through an official negotiation in development of desalination technology in specific regions and also to address matters connected to the water infrastructure available in the territories identified as Palestinian. The United States and Saudi Arabia were not one of the five countries directly engaged in this technology development paradigm. Neither was Israel. This was meant to be an effort to assist and work with the Palestinian people around peaceful, potentially uh, meaningful infrastructure development within their own area that would also provide another manner in which they could engage in negotiations with Israel and other countries in the Middle East. Now, where did that treaty go? Where is the information about where are the commitments that were made under that treaty? Now, we like to try to exotify, I believe, in this country way too much, this sort of fantastical idea of allowing for a kind of normalization to representations of former acts of terrorism or experiences of terrorism as somehow being something to play with or something to flip. And I don't think that's appropriate. If it was ever assessed that Yasser Arafat's attack on the uh, Israeli national water uh, infrastructure uh, put some sort of responsibility on the Palestinian national cause because they chose him as a leader, I think that what would be a much more meaningful, worthwhile, and legitimate aspiration would be to honor the terms of that treaty and to be able to position people and to support people in doing it correctly. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this treaty was potentially negotiated sometime around, if not signed into law or signed into a, approved as a treaty, around the same time the nation of Israel had a Supreme Court commission concerning what was identified as illegal activity regarding its national bank issuances of stocks that it could not support at the time. And I contend to this day that what happened was is there were international interlocutors involved with that scandal and that they instead worked it as part of some sort of long-term political paradigm that was also associated with refusals A, to adequately address ongoing financial uh, malfeasance that was going on in other parts of the world, including the United States, and B, was also attempted for some sort of obscuration and unsustainable recapitulation during the Oslo Accords process of, 19, of the 1990s and ended up involving other entities internationally that were mired in a similar effort to extort them into complicity with that financial malfeasance. And I think we're at a point where we just have to acknowledge it did not work out. So if we're going to be able to salvage or if we're going to be able to find a foundation upon which to base any further movement in the future, then we're going to have to be honest. And we're also going to have to acknowledge what was worthwhile at the time for us to agree to take the risks to make the kind of political decisions we did. That is to say, the current paradigm that I understand is at work with the State Department regarding its relationship with the Palestinian Authority, or rather the Palestinian people, and or other countries of the Middle East that have allowed for a nexus of money laundering that has not served the interests of the United States or any of our allies, is now at a point where it needs to be decommissioned. And we also need to acknowledge that that particular paradigm that I understand began uh, for the first uh, implementation of that specific expression of it, after the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, needs to be decommissioned. If something was attempting now in this year, which would be the 55th year in certain manners, 
to normalize that process of trying to exploit and humiliate people for political leverage, then you got to understand you were not the parties of concern and you were not approved to be proxies.